Hi, and welcome back to another edition of Safety Talks. If it's your first time joining us, welcome to the show. It's an informal community conversation with several safety professionals. And if you're returning, well, welcome back. We're glad to have you. I'm here with Henry Skirvin. He is a safety consultant from Alberta, Canada. Joining us today is Mary Jo Press. You know her from numerous other talks, Bill Stetner and Stephen Stetflag. Now let's dive into our conversation. We're talking about whether or not safety professionals need to take a more leadership role in government emergency management planning. And we'd love to hear your comments about this episode below. Now let's dive into that conversation. I do appreciate everybody uh, spending some time um, to come together and chat. Um, So the one thing that we were, uh, I was talking to a lot of people about, um, Henry and Bill and Steve, and I haven't yet with you, Mary Jo, but we're talking about, um, you know, in our workplaces, um, how are we going to make it safe um, we're, we're dealing with a public health issue, a virus. And so it, for a lot of people, this is um, out of the realm of what they would typically be looking at dealing with. And so um, how do we as safety professionals and practitioners navigate through this? And so Henry came to me with some, some questions that he kind of wanted to ask the community and have a discussion around. Henry, did you want to share a little bit about how that happened? What Certainly. your thinking was? Certainly. Uh, folks, uh, I'm Canadian uh, registered safety professional, member of the Canadian Society of Safety Engineers, and uh, or engineering pardon me up here and um, <clears throat> been working in occupational health and safety forever did the environment side and do the environment side as well uh, Mary Jo like uh, like your task with um, wanted to talk a little bit because I don't have a handle on the United States I have a good handle on Canada on what's going on but uh, I really wanted to know what involvement safety professionals had in the United States in respect to coordinating the response to the public health crisis um, in respect to, uh, well, as OSHA says uh, right now, uh, the hierarchy of hazard controls. So I wanted to throw that out there. And if you need me to explain my question, I can do that. That's the first one, and uh, want to thank uh, Tamara Safepedia for uh, giving us this opportunity. Great, thank you very much. So, did anybody here um, want to take a stab at um, how they are coordinating the the response to this public health crisis, and and really with respect to using our hierarchy of controls to navigate through the hazard? So, from a, a perspective of leading. Who's leading the COVID response for us as the EHS group has really stepped up to say we're taking the reins of this response for our facility and for our company. And we started out with with creating a crisis team and then several other smaller teams that will do operations and response for their own areas. And we do have a shared place that we're doing document management, and I'm actually overseeing the document piece of it so that as one site creates something, we can actually learn from the other site and share that um, along with sharing it with SpaceX, boring companies as well, so that within our own sister companies, we're not having to recreate the same things. But along the lines of your question about the hierarchy of controls, you hit the nail on the head for me. And one of the things that I put together to start with was a a risk response protocol and particularly targeting where we're not able to maintain social distancing, what are those areas? Let's assess them and then let's look at what are the potential protective measures that can be put into place. And I started that whole process with trying to to preface it with here's some examples when you say that I can't maintain social distancing of what I can do. From an engineering standpoint, I can put up um, a temporary wall or a barrier, or I can put in 
um, more high efficiency HVAC system. Or I can simply turn it up to a higher fan setting, or I can change the filtration to, um, you know, a better filter system um, if the system can handle it. So I gave them some examples of just going through one space and then going down the hierarchy of controls and saying, and then if you can't do this, let's move to the next, and then we end up all the way at the bottom of PPE for protection. So that's sort of how I set the policy to start with, but then gave it to the EHS specialists for their own work groups. They would assess their areas, then they would work with their operations department, maintenance department, and others to decide, can we do engineering? If we can't, then let's work down to the next step. Can we do this and then work down from there? Well, I, I can tell you, uh, I'm, I'm an independent consultant and uh, I have several large clients that I, I work with. One in particular uh, who is a large um, refiner <laughs> it goes by the initials XOM and um, I traditionally I for the past year and a half or so I've just been doing project management leadership management with uh, for them uh, but with the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, we've shifted that focus to um, uh, be more focused on safety both for employees and their contractors and we've worked together over the last uh, several days and not a lot of sleep in between there um, putting together plans site-specific plans uh, situational uh, plans um, you know Bill and uh, Henry and, and Mary Jo you, if you've been ever been in a refinery in Tamara there are you know, you have, there are still things you have to do. You have to go in and you have to clean units. You have to, you know, replace piping, uh, install racks. And those are, you know, those call for very close quarters. Suncor, Syncrude, Albion Sands. Uh, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in Fort McMurray on those big projects. Um, and uh, people really have to appreciate that those are live systems. You can't just shut them off. They've got to exactly. be maintained. First action step for us was to first, uh, like Mary Jo said, uh, we've elevated all of the safety precautions. So uh, in some cases, even if you were going into a confined space and it didn't call for fresh air, uh, they're going ahead and using fresh air just because they don't want to risk, you know, anybody getting sick and contaminated. So, you know, everything has just been kind of notched up in terms of, you know, safety precautions, uh, everything from PPE to procedures, um, you know, doing things like uh, temperature testing, you know, at the beginning and at the end of the shift, um, things like that so they can at least identify, hopefully, you know, if anybody has begun to develop symptoms or is coming to work with symptoms uh, and anybody who, you know, gets to the gate and uh, they are, you know, exhibiting any symptoms, then they're sent they're sent on their way home. No, no ifs, ands, and buts, and it doesn't matter if you're a critical, um, you know, skill set or not, uh, they're just not willing to risk it. Can I drill down into, uh, into how you're uh, doing two things? Uh, one is when you're turning them around and walking them, saying go home, what are you giving them in terms of a communication and a contact? And the second question is, uh, when you're turning them around at the gate and it is a critical skill set, how are you backfilling? That's a great question. It's, they've, uh, they've already set up, I don't want to call it triage because it's not really triage, um, but they have uh, developed, they've increased their alliances with uh, area health clinics and uh, urgent care centers, um, you know, industrial health clinics and urgent care centers. Um, in some cases, just even pharmacies like CVS, pharmacy chains, CVS, um, Walgreens, et cetera, are now beginning to step up and offer at least the initial care and uh, some, in some cases, testing um, in some of the sites and some of the locations. So let, let me ask you, because in Canada, we're still in the, the control phase of the viral infection. Um, we have very little infection based on our population compared to other places in the world, including the United States. 
what would you say was the capacity of what you're doing to take beyond your own employees and take members of the general public if the disaster got to that point? And this is simply, uh, if I was doing something here, I'd be putting this down as task 1,993. Right. You guys, in terms well, of capacity. We're, we're pretty much limited in terms of our of the resources that are available I, I'm not yeah. talking monetarily I'm just I'm just talking of you know people boots on the ground um, yeah. so right now the top priority is to make sure employees and the, the contractors are, are safe um, because as you said about earlier, their families Sorry to interrupt again how about family. their families well the first thing is to get them you know and if they are if they are exhibiting symptoms of you know, the flu or, or COVID um, in terms of elevated temperature, because that's really the first, you know, that's the most obvious sign for any of us um, as far as we know right now, um, given what we know. To answer your question, I mean, it, the emphasis right now is, you know, it's really, it's more employee contractor focused. Um, the capacity beyond that, uh, I, you know, right now down in the States, most of the areas that that I've been in contact with, that's all being left up to the public health agencies and, and uh, traditional health care. Uh, my question is really specific to uh, British Columbia, Washington State, and California, and I don't know if any of you folks um, would would relate to uh, to what I'm going to talk about, and that's migrant workers uh, in British Columbia, uh, very much uh, crop and specialty crop oriented. And we bring up uh, lots of uh, people from South America, from Mexico to, uh, to do that. They're, they're all brought up here legally. But one of the things we've done in British Columbia is say, listen, they are an essential service. They are an exception. So we haven't blocked those folks from coming up the coast into our country simply because we don't have the labor force to do that work. I just wanted to share what we did in China, similar to that, just food for thought. And that is when they were bringing people from other provinces, based on where they were coming from, they had to quarantine first before they were allowed to enter the facility and then went through temperature checks. But they, they had a stricter government control of knowing if you're coming from province, whatever, what that quarantine period is. I'm, I'm hearing that most that are getting people coming from an area that you don't really know. You do a 14-day quarantine period for your contractors. Now, the, the first um, would, time we'll see them is screening them at the border. Right, but before they come into your site, you can have no them quarantine. Okay. Then that, that would be a very big concern for me because you don't know what they're bringing you. It's a change in the law that was made up here and what I'm really looking or asking for is do you think it's good or bad that we did that? I don't think it's in hindsight I don't think it was very prudent I'm sure at the time there were you know good reasons to do it but they don't seem you know don't seem so to, <laughs> to be so smart to do right now so you may be something I don't we know. We had a bunch you know, of folks up here growing our pot that they shipped home Growing your what? Growing marijuana for uh, British Columbia to sell in the marijuana stores. Um, <laughs> so you've got you've got people who you don't know the medical history of or the current medical status of uh, 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 processing a crop that doesn't get any sort of filtration and then is either uh, smoked or vaporized uh, into the lungs. Yeah, and how we currently tough have COVID-19. Right, and we currently have a respiratory pandemic. So it, I'm gonna have to agree with Steve, it seems uh, uh, problematic. Now- Yeah, I mean, we just have to it, tell people to stay away from smoking pot. Well, yeah, but it, it's, it's a standard risk management 
practice, right? Oh, here's something we don't want to be in control of, so we'll hire it out. And that way we have no risk, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's a problem, right? It's like moving all the manufacturing to other countries. It, it's all about, oh, we're going we're gonna to save cost and we're going to reduce risk. Um, and it's how we, we as a society have been operating, you know, as a, as a safety or risk management society is, is we say, oh, let's, let's offload the risk and then the risk doesn't exist. But the problem is the risk does. So I'm going to ask one other question and then you'll probably get an idea of where my head goes. Um, at what point in <clears throat> the current situation do we actually put together a super safety committee and dump our knowledge into the process? How do we get our knowledge into the process, which is really... I, you know, I don't think anyone wants it. Huh? Right? Um, so, <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't thinking about whether it was a, something that a government wanted because this is great for any government. It's uh, simply a matter of do we contribute or how do we contribute? So, so I'm in the, in the Bay Area in California, right? I'm, I'm west of where Mary Jo is. Yeah. Um, so we're very high density population here, right? Yep. So, so it has nothing to do with who those people are. It's the fact that there's so many people crammed into such a small geographically limited space, right? Yeah. Um, we just now, one of our counties has canceled their light rail service, which is the one of the forms of public transportation available, yep. okay? Every other county and, and all Bay Area wide, the public transportation is running. And, and if we're gonna have OSHA come out and say that COVID-19 is a recordable injury or illness, um, then shouldn't we be saying, okay, if, if OSHA and the CDC say, we shouldn't have 10 people in a room with highly effective HVAC, why would we put 40 people on a train car with poor HVAC, yeah, right? How do we keep the labs open and working because of the air purification systems? Right, and then, you know, so there, there isn't the money or the desire to improve air purification on public transportation, right? Absolutely not. They'll just kill everything, start fogging it. They'll find that's ineffective and there'll be a community spread on that, but they have to keep it open because they have to keep people going to work. Right. So buses, with buses, at least you can open the windows, but with subway trains and most trains and light rails and things like that, more advanced uh, forms of public transportation, there are no opening of windows. No, right? you're just breathing subway air. You're, exactly. And unlike with a plane, which people have stopped, when, when we go from point A to point B, with everyone in an assigned seat, except for Southwest Airlines, we send a crew through and we clean that airplane before yep. anyone else is allowed on board. And we, we don't do You clean do it, do you sanitize it? Well, yeah, I would, I, would, I would debate that topic. I, they don't I, clean it very well. No, they pick I, up the trash. <laughs> Well, Maybe. But, but my point is, no matter how poorly they clean it, they clean it, right? Correct. Right. No, no one, no one no, cleans no, no, the bus the train or the subway. We have they, to agree to disagree on that. Oh, okay. Uh, um, there's, there's a big difference between clean and sanitize. Oh, and, yes. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Henry, I, I agree with you. Sanitizing is totally different than cleaning. Uh, my only thought was they're not even cleaning the bus or the train car or the subway car until the end of the day. Yeah, it has to go out clean. Then it should, right. it depends on their, their procedure, but it has to be cleaned more than once and it has to be cleaned with sanitizers. Okay. Now, I, when, when I was a firefighter in Santa Clara County, yep. we were 
our, our medical procedures were governed by the Santa Clara County Department of Health. Okay. Yep. And so one of the things we had to do was we had prescribed methods for cleaning backboards. Oh, yeah. Okay. So in between patients, gurneys and backboards and anything that will continue to touch a patient must be sanitized with Clorox wipes and other things. Okay. Yeah. During the MRSA epidemic, the MRSA. Yeah, MRSA. They, they tested uh, the county's backboards and they found that the contaminant existed on greater than 80%. Okay? Because even yeah. though we were trained and skilled professionals with prescribed methods of cleaning, spots were missed. I spent six years with the city of Edmonton Fire Department. Okay. Uh, I was a safety uh, manager at the time. I uh, implemented uh, absolutely the same type of thing. I didn't learn about sanitization till I got into the commercial meat industry at the slaughter level. That's where I learned about sanitation. It's scary, you know, people think yeah. it's clean and man, it's not. No. And um, I'm just gonna jump in here because I want to move us along and, and start to open this up about how, how does safety as a professional group really best assist with the NPIs in response to this? And, and, and Henry, maybe you can kind of crack that open about what you were looking for. And then Mary Jo, if you could kick off with your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, NPIs are non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, I didn't know what, what that was till three weeks ago. Bottom line is, how do we assist not just in our companies, but in society in general and the government senior leadership in terms of offering our assistance of getting involved because we've got all these great skills. So I'm, I'm stopping to just think through that a minute because you're right. We've got a great group of skill sets that are available and we don't have any outreach right now through our professional organizations saying, hey, we've got this list of people who are willing to help in, within your community. Click on the link. That would be I great. I can get it in the New York Times, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I'm part of the American Society of Safety Professionals, and I think it would be great to tap into that body as we try to get something in the media saying, we've got a lot of people willing to volunteer to help. Oh, um, you're brilliant. That's, that's true. We'll just do the same thing up here with the BCRSP, and I won't have to buy I, the newspaper and make Donald mad. Also, I think if you start at the community level, so I, I'm somewhat yeah, fortunate. We've, I'd, I'd, I'd like to go big picture and drill it way down into the community level because we've probably got in the province of Alberta over a thousand safety people that are doing nothing. But where I was coming from was if you start at the community level and then work out instead of drilling oh, down. Absolutely. You know, you, we have a great system up here of community organizations. We could send safety professionals into all of their committee meetings and they're holding a lot of them virtually up here. So that's another great idea. Go ahead, though, on, on the community. Expand on that, could you? Well, I was just going to say I'm very fortunate. I live in a very small rural community. Um, so to this point, we haven't been very much affected other than, you know, people are being very cautious um, in taking steps to not, you know, not, not expose themselves which is a good thing. But at the same time, uh, there's nothing stopping myself or my next door neighbor or anybody around uh, from going down to our local city hall and saying, you know, let's start a list and find out who is in the community. And we have, you know, different social media that we can use. If the local leaders just put it out there, I'm sure, you know, you're going to get people that will be 
volunteering or stepping up at least to identify yeah, this. And, you know, this is a communication strategy that I'm really trying to flesh out with this, uh, this discussion. So one of my thoughts on communication is I have actually subscribed to a few newsletters, which I usually never do, but they are COVID-related updates that I think might be of interest to you as you're trying to think about communication. And for us in the state, they're sort of state-driven. So if I go to a website called Worldometer, then I can drill down to USA, click on that, then I can click on each state. And some of those states have information on how they're managing COVID within their area, but they're not all linked on Worldometer. But if I go and search like Nevada Corona, then I get a newspaper there that's actually doing the deep dive and the data analysis that's feeding up to the worldometer. And it also shows things that are going on and it would be a good place to say, here's, here's resources available to reach out to. So California has got a similar page that again is run by a news group that's doing the same thing. Um, I was just gonna pull up a couple of them you know, while I was talking so I could see who's running that. LA Times is the one that's running it for the state of California. Yeah, um, New York Times, I'm hooked on that one, Mary Jo. Yep, but if I go to each one, each state, and I do North Carolina because that's where I'm from, I get a lot of questions about there as well. We have a plan in Nevada. Um, so I get those updates daily as well. But that might be a good way to put the name out there that you're available. Um, and look, you know, look at your province communications to see who that communication person is and see if we can't get something posted there. In Canada, there will be safety professionals or safety practitioners or fire safety guys or politicians or political safety people on committees at a provincial level, but they are not involved in the management of it. They're there as a resource. Do you think they should be there as a member of the team or a resource to the team? <laughs> Go ahead, Good Bill. question, though, isn't it? It's a, it's a marvelous question. And, and I think when, when, we, when we put people into leadership positions, are we looking at a technical expertise? Are we looking at leadership expertise? Are we looking at loyalty and longevity, you know, what are we looking at? And generally, uh, at least in, in America, I don't know about Canada precisely, but we're basing everything on uh, academic success, okay, as opposed to uh, anything else. So you might have someone who has a master's degree or a doctorate degree in an unrelated field running uh, a, a regional or state or federal uh, emergency response organization that is staffed with lots and lots of uh, uh, fire rescue and emergency responders, first responders that are on their staff. And so we're dependent upon that person being smart enough to listen to their staff. Um, and, and that's just... So we're, 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 trained, kind of we're, we're trained with the same manuals you guys are trained on for emergency response on the fire side and at the provincial and state level where emergency response is still running it yeah, on the reaction side. The, so we yeah, learn from the same book. Emergency services and, and it might have a different name and everyone's got mutual aid agreements and things like that. Oh, all over the place, sat on committees everywhere out there, uh, Fort Saskatchewan at the... Uh, Exactly. So, yeah. but, you know, we, we as emergency uh, responders or first responders bring forth information to these leaders um, and we say, oh, well, you know, the smart thing to do is let's stop all public transportation. And then the leader says, well, we can't, just like you said, Henry, we can't stop all public transportation, right? We have yeah. to keep going. 
uh, everyone will will freak out if we stop it. People won't be able to get to their jobs. There'll be riots in the streets. It's not necessarily a better idea to have uh, first responders or trained safety people or, or accredited safety people in those roles. That, that role is trying to accomplish uh, many tasks uh, or, or is beholden to many leaders at the same time does that make it's sense? impossible yeah 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 it is response impossible. is get there handle it when you have to actually get to business continuity get other experts in when you have to get to total recovery get the politicians in it's it's like steps one two and three and emergency response is one would you agree yeah and Honestly, we seem to like that better, right? Being reactionary is so much more fun than being proactive. <laughs> and it's so much easier because it's all written down. Right. And all you have to do is find people to blame, right? It's so much easier to go to people and ask for money to be proactive about something that's not an immediate threat. It's tantamount to disaster. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like what I experience in working with clients and particularly regarding crisis management and putting together crisis management plans. If there's no crisis, nobody wants to talk about it. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it's almost like we don't want to even broach this subject because we just, we, Bad luck. you know, you know they, they put their fingers yeah. in their ears and they don't want to either, they don't want to pay for it or, they don't want to think about it until a crisis hits. And then, you know, then it's like, oh my gosh. Well, can't you just push a button and give us your plan? Well, no, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, it, it so what, um, uh, what, Henry, what you're, what you're, look, you're asking is, I think, are we looking at doing something ahead of the curve or are we more comfortable doing something behind the curve? That's a that's a really good question. Where do safety professionals think they best fit? Well, and, we all, uh, everybody in just about in the safety profession knows we do, we are much better at doing it ahead of the curve. The problem is convincing the business leaders and the politicians and everybody else that that's a good idea. Yep. Well, we're, frankly, uh, we're, we're way past response planning here. Exactly. We're in, the, we're in the situation now where we have to do both. We can respond to the disaster that's occurring every day, but we're also needing to be in the proactive mode of thinking what we can do for tomorrow. So we as safety professionals have to wear both of those hats right now. We have to still deal with today's crisis and be in the business of business continuity and how are we getting back to our new normal down the road. So I think we have to step out of, you know, what's wrong with the, the situations and, you know, if the right people are on the committees or not, and just think about, you know, what role can we play to make a positive impact going forward? Because that's really all we can control. Um, I agree with what you just said as well in terms of getting back to work and getting back to work correctly and safely because it can absolutely be done in terms of managing the hazard. And that goes sure. back to the first question we talked about tonight. Steve or Bill, did you have um, something you wanted to add? Well, I just want to go back to something that uh, Henry talked about a little earlier in that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is pretty unique. I think we can all agree on that. I don't think we've ever, you know, in our lifetimes have seen anything like this. Um, so, in terms of response, I think to some extent, I mean, we are doing the right things. We've got pretty much our medical leadership. Uh, they're stepping up in this situation. Unlike a natural disaster like an earthquake, uh, for instance, I was in Northridge when, when the earthquake hit uh, there in, what was it, 91 or 92. And in that situation, it, were, it was, you know, the first responders who were really on the front line and they were the ones who were taking command and making decisions on what is safe 
Uh, and then they would call, you know, they called out the Army Corps of Engineers to do the inspections on structures and uh, bridges and, and highways and so forth. So I think you have to look at it in terms of what is the nature of the crisis. And, you know, yes, we're, as a safety professionals, we should be out, you know, at the forefront to the extent that we are needed to be. But right now, I think it's more of a medical um, leadership issue. Uh, and we can be there in a support role, but I personally, you know, don't have a medical a doctorate and I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to take that leadership role. Oh, absolutely not. But you could run the um, management team or the board of, uh, of such a response. Absolutely. Sure. And, and that's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not talking, I'm, I'm talking senior, senior safety people, capable, brilliant, genius people, and I'm not saying that any of us are, but boy, some of you have really impressed me. I think that what we can offer best right now is a piece of advice to the American president to get every one of his military, National Guard, medics identified and then negotiate with your Department of Defense to get 60% of them on planes into the hot spots where medical professionals are needed. You don't leave the military alone. They still have their medics, but we get how many thousands of medics into the system? It, it's, it's problematic because uh, to, even as an EMT, uh, to practice, you have to have a, a county license, okay? And in order to get that county license, the easiest way is to have been accredited by national testing, okay? Your president has the power to uh, cancel that. Uh, um, I'm, that, is, that is possible, but it, it falls under uh, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Public Health, and a few other things. Uh, when when uh, the military responds to emergencies like uh, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that, uh, military medics go, but they're generally only allowed to do first aid type stuff um, unless they have, uh, you know, unless they're there as a unit under the command of a licensed doctor. Okay. There you go. Then they have Beautiful. medical oversight. If we just grab the medics they're not, you know, because a, a military medic is allowed to do uh, IVs and other things, and an EMT is not. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're... Just jump in for a second. Sure. sure. Uh, the president has already given the call for retired physicians and nurses to come back, and they don't have to have their license to be able to come back and support, and they're returning by the droves. We also have Army medics um, that can do the same thing. Um, you know, there's, there's so many people that have served in the military and have that ability. My husband sitting in the other room, for example, he, he was a corpsman. There's no reason that we can't activate those people who have the skills to help. The, while we all agree, I think, that normally reaction is easier than proactive actions after something like this for a very small window yes. proactive actions will be uh, popular and available right um there, there will be money there will be people listening right and so our opportunity is coming when everyone stops being terrified and buying all the toilet paper until everyone goes back to normal, there will be a small window. And, and that window is when we have to be ready to, to strike and, and get a foothold on, you know, improving reality, right? So little things that we can do is we can all talk offline. There's a, it, it's a marvelous thing because now there's all these safety people who 
have extra time on their hands because nobody's at work. So, and except for Mary Jo and Steve, right? Um, so as we, as we war game scenarios, right? You know, how we stop the next pandemic. You know, we're, we're not qualified to, to stop the next epidemic because we're not medical doctors, but, but we can put in place uh, uh, sound ideas or contribute to the people who have the ability to make those decisions, sound ideas for, okay, we have an epidemic here. How do we prevent it from becoming a pandemic? I, I love what you're saying. The only uh, thing that I would add to it is that while we may not be qualified to contribute medically to the control or success uh, of treatment of a pandemic, as safety professionals, we are certainly capable of running the response and saying, give me 15,000 doctors here, give me 15,000 um, sure. respirators, give me 15,000 medics, blah, blah, blah. We can still run that plan. That's well, a scenario think- we can game very, very well. And we do that, and we've got safety professionals doing both those things. So some cross the lines and are also paramedics. I've been one for 30 years. So I think we have to think a little more generally here, not think about just the view that we've seen, but think about what we can offer for the whole big picture going forward. We have to start trying to lead our safety professionals to think, what about the future? How do we prepare from now to get to where we know we need to be. And I, oh, I, yeah. we, have to, we have to start engineering uh, some of these responses into our processes and systems, just like uh, you know, in the refineries uh, in um, processing plants, you have process safety um, engineering. And I think if we are um, process safety management, which these are engineered concepts, they're, you know, when units were popping off, you know, back in the 70s and early 80s in refineries, you know, the, the people said, hey, you know, the leaders that the powers that be said, hey, time out. How do we engineer safety into our processes so that we reduce our risk, minimize our risk and ultimately reduce our cost and loss of life? So or something along those lines. Uh, Reduce no our sense. costs. Loss of life is a negligible point. Yeah, I won't be. I'm not going to go on the record as saying that, but. Um, oh, no, I, I'm just talking from a profit motive side, not personally. Absolutely, but at any rate, either way, whether it was to save money or uh, reduce their insurance cost, whatever it was, they found a way to develop this concept called process safety uh, management (PSM), and this. What, they, what has not been included in that process or engineered into that process to this point is a response to a, uh, a pandemic such as this. But I, I think if we ta- apply those same principles that you would in, uh, in process safety management to this situation, you can you know, take advantage of uh, Bill's window of opportunity here. So we do have some response things that are already built into FEMA and ICS. In fact, when I was in in my master's program, I wrote several papers about responses and how we've learned from the past and apply it to the future. And this is a perfect example where we need to take today's situation and be able to come out of this miles above in the future. I participated in a tornado response in Petersburg, Virginia almost 30 years ago that we identified having radios on the same frequency is what led to our success. And we had learned that from being at the NASCAR covering safety for no dollars so that we could get money for the Volunteer Rescue Association. We learned how to respond together. That's part of what instituted having statewide frequencies on the 800 radio systems. And if you look at the news articles, about looking back to that tornado, it says we learned from that and we changed how we set up our communication systems for the future. We can take this same issue and we can leapfrog it into how do we have a a process management plan when it comes to business continuity and disaster management so we can leapfrog for the next future.
future. Exactly. I mean, Dig Alert is a great example of that, you know, that everyday people use all the time. You know, it's simple. You're going to ex excavate a trench in your backyard. Well, you not, might want to find out what's underground. And we set up the Dig Alert, you know, the 1-800 Dig Alert system. So just... We have that up here too. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. We've got the knowledge. It's not, it's not a lack of knowledge. But I think it's, go ahead, Bill. No, no, after you. So sorry. I was just going to add that I think it's just, it's more of, you know, getting people to act and pay attention and, and be reasonable and sensible about it and not stick your head in the sand and say, you know, it's not going to really happen or, you know, you're, you're trying to sell me something that I don't need. We tried to get them to do tabletop exercises for years, and now they're in the midst of the situation and wish they had practiced. So this is the opportunity to say, we have to institute the requirement to practice so you're going to be ready. Now, Bill, you had a question or a statement? Well, so love what Mary Jo's saying, love what Steve's saying, love what Henry's saying, right? All, all that is, is good. Um, but part, part of the premise of Henry's original question was, you know, how can we as the, the community of safety professionals help, right? Part, part of the problem is we as a society of safety professionals or an industry or whatever you want to call us have a perception problem in the rest of the world, right? Absolutely. So on the one side, we have the traditional safety cop, right? I walk around and I issue safety violations and I tell people that they're bad and I, I quote rules. And on the other hand, we have a different view on safety. And the problem is it's not just one, right? We've got five or six different views on safety. Um, and where we're trying to say, oh, let's be process-based or let's, let's look at this scientifically instead of carrot and stick, okay? Uh, whether you call it safety two or safety differently or resilience engineering or whatever you want to call it, in, until the Canadian BCSP and the various associations of safety professionals can wrap their arms around having to pick one, right? Just, just like the, the uh, medical associations say, here are our guidelines. Here is what is good medicine, right? And if you're outside of this, you, whatever you are, you're not a member of our association and we don't recognize you. And, and so we, we need to take a stand on safety to build up our uh, uh, I, value is the wrong word to use, but maybe uh, uh, build up our uh, uh, cachet of of ability, right, and perceived ability to be taken seriously. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's fabulous, Mary Jo. You're an EMT. You say you have a husband in the other room who's aware of everything that's going on. What would you do with your family right now? I've got a daughter 5,000 kilometers away. I've got two sons 30 kilometers away. One of them's traveling 1,500 kilometers away. What would you do with your family? Today, I say we need to stay where we are. Now, hopefully... Shelter in place? Have, yes. So hopefully we have prepared by being self-reliant. We built up our food storage. We didn't have to panic shop. We, we really are back to the basics and making sure we can take care of ourselves for a few weeks and not have to worry about going out the door. I think that's where we are today. I'm, I'm going to have to agree with her. The shelter in place thing... Uh, I realize that we're allowing people to go out for, you know, quote unquote, necessary trips. Yeah. But I, I don't think that is, 
is effective. I, I agree with her, unless you absolutely have to go out, stay at home. Limit your interaction with everyone. You can, you can call people, you can talk to them if you're six, six or seven feet away, but limit that and then we stand a chance of uh, keeping my loved ones safe, right? I, I can't do anything about the rest of the world right now this instant. So my people uh, are from North Dakota. And uh, before North Dakota, they were from Norway and Ireland. We have a long history of having enough food in the house for a year how are your farmers going to put crops in the ground this spring? Well, I, I live in farm country, so I can, I'll feel that one. Uh, I guarantee you there's the farmers in this area here, they're, they're just proceeding almost business as usual. They're I've farm farmers in this region here are kind of a different breed. I mean, they just, and again, just by the nature of the rural area, they're isolated um, to the extent that, yes, you know, you have to, you know, the nearest, I'm not even going to say large city, the nearest city that's got it, you know, a population of 80,000 is 30 miles away. So, yeah. uh, you know, we're kind of insulated and fortunate in that respect, but they're not, they're not slowing production in terms of um, planting crops or raising cattle or, you know, uh, other uh, uh, food supplies. So that I don't think is changing. Plus the industry is so mechanized, 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 ugh, it's getting late. I can't speak. Um, that it's not, you know, you don't, it doesn't take, you know, 20 people to plow, you know, five acres like it used to. It's, you know, it's, it's a tractor. He can go out and do 10,000 acres. So yeah, my neighbor does 29,000 acres and they've got a cattle feedlot as well. It's a huge operation. Right, but it's probably oh, it's probably not that you don't have that many people doing it. But I think to get back to your other question real quick, um, as a society, we built in this whole just-in-time uh, supply chain. Uh, we didn't Got always it. have that. And that's, that's fairly recent. I mean, over the last 20, maybe the most, 30 years. But it's really become ramped up over the last 10 years. Yeah, it was actually Henry Ford that uh, started that uh, back in the early, early 1900s. Um, actually, uh, just in time, I thought that was coined by Deming. Oh yeah, that's a phrase and that's the quality control, quality system uh, that Deming put into Japan after World War II. Right, but it didn't really resonate here until I would say until, the mid seventies I mean, or the early eighties, but we've just become so accustomed yeah. to that, you know, yeah, I just no, need something and, I'm going to uh, store and pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, doing a very good textbook on management or pardon me uh, on uh, quality and Drucker's got a really good text on, uh, on management. So but maybe looking, guys, looking they ahead out of the Henry Ford school of business. Yeah, but looking ahead, maybe as a society, we step back just a little bit and say, hey, that may not be the best model. Um, maybe there's a hybrid that we need to do or adopt, you know, go back to some of the, you know, the older ways. Because stores, you know, I've, I've been looking at things all over the Internet and on the news every day. Stores shelves are empty. They're bare and they're not, you know, it's getting difficult to get replenished, you know, supplies replenished. And, you know, because you've got this situation where now everybody's just out buying. And Scared. whereas if we were already stocked to the to have, you know, as Mary Jo says, to have a couple of weeks food, then you don't have that panic. But if I've got enough food for two days, yeah, you know, then people are panicking. But we've created that. Yeah, we absolutely did create it because it gives us a better handle on the control of the money. Well, I want to thank everybody. That is the, all the time we have for today. 
So thank you so much, everybody, for coming and joining the conversation. It was awesome. Thanks, Tamara. It certainly was, and thank you so much. I am so very, very impressed with you folks, and thank you for, uh, for sharing with me your thoughts on this. It gives me some comfort. Henry, it's been a pleasure, right. and Bill, and Mary Jo. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. See ya. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Safety Talks. We hope you enjoyed the show with Henry, Steve, Mary Jo, and Bill. If you're looking for the show notes, please navigate to safeopedia.com and you can now find them under the podcast tab. If you're looking to go to a virtual conference, we've got one for you. Safety Connects happening October 2020. It's free to register for attendees, so go to Industry Connect safety.com and you can register there and if you're looking to be a virtual exhibitor or a speaker connect with me through dm or my email and we can chat about it are you looking for some resources to share out with your team visit us at safepedia.com where you can find the latest in webinars articles and q a's coming out daily until next time stay safe